Um, I work upstairs uh, and I'm interested in functional programming and I thought I'd you know, give a talk as a way of making sure I actually learn something. So here's my talk. Um, it's going to be very beginner and basic. Um, so you know, hopefully for those of you who are new to functional programming, you might get something out of it. For those who are, who are not so new, maybe you can tell me where I am, where I'm wrong. <laughs> but anyway, so let's get going. So chapter five is all about laziness. And, um, and so what I think the kind of the real key, uh, my key takeaway from, from this chapter, from like, you know, what is the whole point of laziness is laziness allows you to operate over functions, well, operate over data structures that are infinite. And I think that's quite remarkable. Um, and it allows you to write code that, that sort of ha doesn't need to really think about that that data structure is infinite. And so you might ask, okay, well, what's an example of an infinite data structure? And you know, you might, for, for instance, perhaps Twitter, the uh, constant Twitter feeds, it's largely infinite, although, you know, certainly fine out today, but there'll be more tomorrow. Um, you might have a fractal, you know, so you can compute this um, mathematical thing down to like, you know, as many times as you want, there's still more to go. That's probably actually maybe infinite. Um, you might have stocks, again, a bit like Twitter, they're, you know, they just keep coming and coming and coming and away you go. Um, and you also might have something like the game of Go, which, although not infinite, is extremely complicated. Um, and, you know, if you want to, like, work out all the states, the Go board is the number. So, um, one of the things that lazy, uh, you know, program, well, you know, um, that this allows you to do is it allows you to uh, do complex sort of handling in a much easier way. So just step me through this simple example. So we've got this list here, um, and we want to perform a map and a filter and then another map over that list. Um, and so if we just step through it, um, you know, we first of all we map add 10 to all those elements, and then we might filter it, um, you know, by um, taking the modulo, seeing if it's equal to zero, and then we get another list here, and then finally um, we'll actually multiply that by three and we get our, our result. And that's all well and good. That kind of makes sense. You know, okay, cool. What's the point? Well, the point is, what if that initial list was infinite? What if that was yeah, a Twitter stream or something? If you are using the kind of mechanics we've learned so far in this book, you, you would get stuck at the first point. You would be unable to compute, you know, map plus 10 because you'd just be trying to, you know, finish going through all the lists because you have to construct the complete list before you, you can move on to the next stage. And maybe you don't actually care about the, you know, the, the thousandth element of that list for whatever you're doing. And so what we're trying to do is, is a nice way of, of um, of solving this. Before we, we get into the details, I need to just make some, do some terminology and, and blah blah blah. Um, so, do, um, you know, I'm going to talk about a lazy function. Uh oh, I see some looks that say that I'm not right. But anyway, I'm going to say a non strict lazy function is a function that chooses to not evaluate one of its arguments. Um, and I'm going to call a thunk an unevaluated function argument. Um, so, Okay, we're talking about lazy, lazy functions, lazy. Do we know anything that's already lazy you know, in maybe other languages? And uh, so, does anybody have it, an idea? I'll just tell you whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, consider the output of the following, um, where we have you know false, you know ampersand ampersand, and then a thing that prints something and then is true. We know that in most languages, um, if you know you have an ampersand and the, the first thing is false then it will just ignore, it sort of short circuits the rest. And, and that's, that's lazy, right? That's, uh, that's sort of, um, yeah, lazy. And so that's, that's all we're doing. We're just gonna sort of do a framework around making this uh, better, allowing us to do this in other ways. So to get to a more tangible example, let's do something really fun, let's re-implement if. Um, and so, you know, okay, cool. So what is this, what might this look like? Well, yeah, so it's defined two things path one, path two, some value, and away we go. Um, and so what the, you know, what the, uh, you know, what the function definition for if might look like is something like this, where we're going to say, okay, it's going to take some conditions and boolean, um, and then on true, we'd like it to evaluate some function that's passed in, which takes no arguments. And then on false, we'd like it to evaluate some function that's passed in and take some arguments, and then returns a value of, of a. Um, and, and this this sort of this notation here, which which actually is just sort of a you know pretty much a function that takes no the type of a function that takes no arguments, is a thunk. And um, 
And so the implementation, of course, it uses if. So we're reimplementing it using if, maybe that's a bit dodgy. But um, you know, we, we know that it's only ever going to evaluate one of those two paths. It's not going to evaluate both um, path one and path two. And, and Scala allows us to remove some parentheses around the place. So we can just you know, convert that to that, and we don't need to have these um, things here necessarily. OK, let's get even more lazy. Um, so we might have a function, and it's got a lazy kind of argument, um, this not lazy function here. And we have some other function, and we want to pass that into not lazy. So on this third line here, we're going to go not lazy. We're going to give it this, um, this function expensive. And expensive could do lots of things, but in this case, it's just going to print i. Um, and you know, because in our not lazy function, um, you know, it's going to return this tuple. It's going to evaluate that function twice, and that's sort of a bit wasteful, right? We prefer that we didn't do that. Um, so we can use this keyword lazy and create a sort of a, a temporary variable, which will mean that when we evaluate this this function, you know, more lazy, it just does it once. And so that's that's neat. Um, at least I think so. Anyway. And so you know, it's sort of building blocks. But where are we getting to? We're trying to get to this idea of a list that is, um, you know, that is potentially infinite that we don't have to actually compute all the stuff on it. And so, what's that called in Scala? It's called a string. Um, and you know, similar to the, the sort of the list type that we might be uh, familiar with previously, um, we've got you know kind of a notion of an empty list, and we also have a notion of a constructor that allows us to construct by adding elements to the top of the list. Um, and if you look at the type signature here, you can see that um, yeah, you know, it's just taking um, lazy uh, sort of function arguments, and away we go. So what does this object look like? Well, th th this this empty thing is a it is called a smart constructor, but it's really there um, apparently for some type safety if you read the book. But it's really there to be sort of the pairing to this um, lowercase cons that we define here. And what this means is that this allows us to write um, strings such that um, you know we're not going to fall into that trap that we saw on the previous slide, where we could. You know, have it evaluating things over and over again. It would be much better if it were to just cache things for us. Um, and then, if you look at this stuff, there's also this um, this apply function, which um, allows you to add multiple you know elements to a string in a sort of a neat way with this weird syntax that I haven't seen before until now. <coughs> um, okay, cool. So, data structures, <coughs> infinite streams. Give me a tangible, you know, infinite stream. Why don't you? And here we go. We have the infinite stream of once. Um, so on the next slide, I've got what I had on the bottom at the top here, and this is a sort of conceptual idea of what's going on. So this is, um, you know, ones is a, is a variable which is a stream of type int, and it's an infinite list of ones. And so on the left-hand side of this image, you can see this is sort of conceptually what that looks like. It's um, it's just the one which is concatenated to to the ones recursively, and you can imagine that you could unroll that. In infinitely, um, and so that's that's an infinite list of ones, um, and that's really cool. But something we might want to do on an infinite list because we actually can't do anything if we have an infinite list, right? You know, our computer will try to compute over it, will run out. Um, so we might need to have some way of, of shortening it, and so that's when this notion of take comes in. And so take is just a it's just a function that's just going to take n number of elements from that infinite list. So you know, for instance, if we wanted to take four elements, we would call this function, and that's its definition there. It's kind of cool. Um, you know, it just uses um, uses pattern matching from from the previous chapter, and uh, you know, away we go. Um, oh yeah, and there it is evaluating thumbs for us. Okay, so I wanted to get back to that original problem that we had. So we've talked about um, we've talked about an infinite data structure. We've talked about a way of capturing just what we want from that data structure. Um, and to, to get to that actual point that's similar to the initial one, I want to introduce a function called from. Now, from is fairly simple. It's just like ones, except instead of adding one to the end of the list, it adds the new number plus one. So it's 
the infinite list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 to infinity. Um, and so if we look, and this is the, the original transform that we, we had at the beginning. Um, so we have from 1, which is that infinite list, and then we would like to map that by adding 10, filter it, you know, take, find all the even numbers, and then multiply it by 3. Um, at this point, result is, is not really computable, right? It's a stream of numbers, and it's not, we can't really do anything with it. Um, well, we can, but you know, it's sort of infinite. But we can make it finite by calling take on this stream. So take is, was defined as a sort of a method on that, um, on that stream structure. Thing or a trait, anyway, whatever. Um, and so, and we can evaluate it. The really neat thing, though, is that take is going to take um, the the first three elements from that list that successfully get to the end of this process. So, if if take for instance, um, you know, we hit the first number is one, and then um, that gets mapped plus ten gets to eleven, and then it gets filtered out. Um, you know, then mod 2, you know, 11 mod 2 is not equal to 0, so that gets dropped. That kind of automatically happens. We don't have to think about that. Um, it just takes the, the, the first three that manage to pass through this um, process. And that's kind of neat. That's sort of something we got for free by, by like stepping back and saying, okay, you know, we're going to do this process. Um, I think that's neat. And yeah, even though it's part of the homework, homework's cool. Okay. Um, I'm probably going super fast, so that's all right, everybody can go home early. Um, but what's another example, and I sort of touched on this earlier, of a problem that has an infinite data structure that you could, could work over. And I'm not going to do the code for this because I, 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 I'm not an expert in solving Go problems, but we know that was recently solved. And how is it solved? Well, so <coughs> Go, the game Go, and, and many chess-based problems, they have a uh, several components. One component tries to assess how good a particular uh, you know, uh, configuration of the board is. And then there's another component that just allows you to explore the search space, explore the, the trees of possible, um, you know, uh, you know, possible moves that could be played by players. And, and then there's another component that allows you to decide how to move through this tree. And the neat thing about you know, lazy evaluation is that this this infinite data structure can just be worked with without needing to think too hard about, you know, what is it going to do? Um, how come it's so big? And we can move up and down the tree. And it's only ever going to construct enough of that structure for us to evaluate whatever queries are coming from the algorithm that wants to move through the tree and the algorithm that wants to determine how good a particular move is. And that's pretty neat. That's pretty powerful. Um, and so that's sort of a composition uh, element that you get with um, with laziness. And so that's my summary. So, what we summary? Um, you know, there's a, there's a few people frowning at me. Um, uh, you know, but basically the whole point of why you should care, as I said about a million times, is infinite data structures are awesome. It's going to make your life simpler. Um, and you know, look out, look out for that just sort of function arrow because that means that um, variable is going to be uh, sort of lazily evaluated. Cool. Statements. Statements. Yes. Yeah, I have some question about the take. Uh, you can you can uh, invoke take twice with free and you get another free element, or it will evaluate the same one. So you can reuse uh, the ones that the was already compiled. I mean, uh, the result of the first one. So you could you could take three and then take three again, um, and it would take the result of that. Um, so if we go back to to that guy, um, the result of this is is a sort of a stream containing those three numbers, and that's another stream, and we can call take on that as well. Um, let's say we didn't take three, say we took nine, um, we could then go take three, and then we would receive those three numbers, um, even though the the stream that we're taking from was, was sort of larger. Um, so, yeah, so, so the, the definition of take um, keeps it still in this sort of stream kind of data structure. Um, and you can, can you do it on the same stream? I mean, like, take three and then take three after that. Oh, right, so you want to take three and then take the next three. Yeah. Because in the Go example, you can actually, uh, in, if you already have a tree structure and you do one move, you don't need to reevaluate the first part of the tree that is already evaluated. 
before. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I I suspect that you could. Um, it depends on the type of stream you're using. There's a mutable stream and an immutable one. And I'm pretty sure the immutable one works like you're describing. If you repeat the take, it uh, reproduces the reproduces the output of the original one without recalculating anything. But the mutable stream just keeps progressing forward further and further. But a mutable example would probably be would probably have another method which would give you another stream which starts after three. Yeah, give you like the yeah, take and yeah. the, the rest. Yeah. So it would sure actually, for that. practically, it would still end up re-evaluate the same tree in the, from the first step. Uh, not necessarily. No? I think you could. Like, if you're talking about Twitter feed, and you're going to have, like, you want to do some computation on each of the Twitter yeah. posts. The interface is a bit different for something like a Twitter feed. You use what's called a generator, which is known to perform operations in the background. So you do take three of a generator, and you get the first three elements off of the generator. So the interface is a bit different, which takes care of those concerns mostly, I think. The implementation for the homework, if you took three and then took three, you can get the same string. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so yeah, take to, to be clear, so I'm clear. <laughs> Um, what, you're, what you're saying there is that if you went result take three and then you made a new line and went result take three again, or you get the same after three. That, take three, don't take three. Yeah, you'd also get the same. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Okay, I have yeah. a question about lazy and strict evaluation. <clears throat> All right. Say we have a list from one to ten. Yeah. Say we take the entire length of the list. Isn't that exactly, exactly the same as strict evaluation, like you evaluate all the way to the end? Or would there be a difference? Yeah. Um, the difference is in when the evaluation happens. Uh -huh. yeah. Strict evaluation happens when you declare the list. Lazy evaluation happens when you consume the list. Okay. Wouldn't well, the main consumption still be the same? Problem? Like if you're like if you're asking for up to the last element of the list, it's still going to have to use up like ten slots. So. Eventually, but like if it's between the decorate. If there's an expense well, it's the time when the memory gets consumed. Ah. So if you have some expensive long running operation in the middle between when you declare the stream and when you start consuming off of it, okay. then the memory doesn't get used until that later stage. Okay, so in that case it can be more still beneficial to go lazy. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, laziness is just an, an optional thing. It's not the whole language isn't lazy. It's no. it's just a keyword of lazy. Well, and oh. some other things. I it's, guess it's it, like yeah. I guess it was confusing because it's a keyword lazy that, that um, that, that caches the, the value so it can be reused. Um, and then there's this, you know, um, thunk kind of thing that I've been saying where you can, you know, give a function arrow to say this argument is may be evaluated by the function or by. Um, so it's not. It's explicitly lazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you have right. to say you want to be lazy. Yeah, yeah, you have to go out of your way to make it happen in Scala. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that's right. And it's often full of bugs. Like you can, you can, <laughs> you can call the call by name stuff twice and do the computation twice accidentally and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Such a glowing endorsement of the language. <laughs> Is there like an automatic way to like check that with the no or no warning? Um, I, I would recommend don't, don't use it for state uh, for effectful stuff. And as well, if it's usable or effectful stuff, make sure you put like parentheses in. So yes. It's very explicit. I, yeah, they, I guess, to be clear, if you were going to do any laziness in Scala, you need effect tracking. There was a bug at work, thankfully not by me, uh, that was exactly that. Using some kind of uh, the expressions that had effects as part of it, but also did some kind of lazy uh, monoid append, and the effects weren't happening because of that laziness. Uh, how so did you how do you crack it down? You cry, <laughs> <laughs> and then the puddle of tears eventually <laughs> finds the blood. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you have to be very careful with that, especially with things like Scala Zip, like because the, the, these things it's not obvious from calling the thing whether it's lazy or not, uh, and that's why or the FP people don't harp on about purity for no reason. There is a really big need that if you have any kind of laziness, which you need to do some kind of abstractions, you can't have untracked effects in there because you will do bad things.
Yeah. Can I ask a really dumb question? Yeah. What, so how do you track your effects? Uh, in Scala Z, there's an I.O. Uh, monad and there's task. So you, you put all your effects in there so that they are, and they happen inside that, that monad. Okay. So. Is there a pure for you where you can guarantee that there's no nothing happening outside? No. <laughs> You just have to promise. <laughs> uh, by convention, yeah, you, you just do it by convention. You say like, Ben, you know, you trust me. I'm not going to do any side effects and ruin your day. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and Ben says a similar thing to me. If you want a language, if you want a language where this stuff works properly, Haskell is the way to go. Uh, what, what if sometimes Ben is not always being reliable? What if sometimes it's, it's, Ben is stuck Then you switch from convention to threats. Sign a fight and do a poll to Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Code review comes around and someone gets a smack down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mention IO and Sorry? A task. task. Task has some additional stuff in there for uh, doing nice things with going off, uh, executing the thing in a different thread and all that kind of wonderfulness. Uh, some people want to remove it and I don't quite understand why. Uh, yeah. In my head, like just in pure script, having f and af is a good thing. Having the split is a nice thing, but they're smarter than me. I'm sure they know what they do. Did I? Shall I continue? Yep. Cool. B stateful. There's a meme. I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything fun to like make us all happy. So there you go. There's a meme. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So state. What's state all about, right? So you know. Uh, I'm sure everybody in this group is all willing to listen to the drink the functional programming Kool-Aid, but often people are like, what, you can't do state? Um, I was a bit like that when I came to this thing. Um, so, you know, a you know, canonical example for dealing with state is dice rolling and random number generators, because um, typically you, are, you need to have some kind of internal state in, inside the computer, a seed value or something that you have to keep track of, otherwise you'll keep getting the same numbers over and over again. Um, and so if you were to do this in Scala, not a you know, functional style Scala, you might construct a function like this. Um, there's actually a, a subtle problem in this function in that it's trying to you know, represent a, um, a six-sided die, but it's um, you know, going to sometimes roll a zero, which you, you can't do. Um, you know, and it's going to you know, most of the time pass your tests if you're sort of randomly um, rolling this die. And the reason to fail will depend upon some hidden state hidden inside this you know, scala.util.random thing. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, we don't do that. Um, so how do we deal with state? And what, what, what even is it? And so there's this cool picture. I like this picture. This picture, to me, summarizes the whole point. And state's actually really simple once you can grok this picture. Um, and so this is in the context of, of passing seeds for, for random number generation. Um, but you, you can kind of just imagine that that state is just another function, another variable to your function that you just pass in along with everything else that you want it to do. Um, and then when that function returns, it has to return a variable that says, this is how I've changed the world or changed the state. And then that's cool. You can keep going and you can just pass it through. And so that's what these sort of arrows to me represent is just the sort of state of the system just getting sort of passed through. Um, and that's actually the fundamental idea, and if you can understand that, you just go home now, because that's it. Right? That's all that state is in functional programming. Um, but let's continue. So we're going to construct a random number generator, um, and the kind of idea is, is somewhat similar to what I said. You know, we're going to have um, we're going to have a, a sort of seed that you have to feed into this sort of object. It's going to we're going to call next int on it, and then it's going to return this um, you know the value that we want, like our random number plus the state for the next time we're going to call it. Um, and so here's an example, straight from the textbook, um, of what a random class um, might look like. You know, so we've got this trait up here. So we want um, we want it to we want this thing, you know, ran a runge to um, expose a method called next int, and that's you know if we call that method, it's just going to um, provide for us an int that we've asked for, and also a new runge, which will hopefully be, um, you know, rng, okay, sorry, let's say runge, which we're going with. Um, it won't be a, uh, that, that new rng will be a, a new state that we can sort of uh, keep asking call, you know, next int on. 
Um, and so if you look in the guts of it, all it's doing in this silly implementation is just doing some, some weirdo bit shift and in whatever, trying to make something sort of pseudo-random. Um, and then it returns um, a integer and also the, the sort of next um, the next state. Oh, might have handy uh, little arrows. Cool. There you go. Um, great. Sweet. So how might we use this? Um, so we might want to define a function called random pair, and I want to get a random pair of integers, and I'm going to pass into it a uh, RNG. Um, and if you look at this, it's pretty straightforward. Um, all we do is we just follow the arrow. So the function takes in an RNG, then we go get that RNG we call next int on it, and that produces for us, as we described, a uh, int that we've asked for, and then an RNG. And then we take, it, you have to be careful because you have to take the one you just received. If you take the one that you, you got at the top here and, and pass it to this next thing, you'll get the same number again. So you've got to make sure that you thread this through correctly. Um, and, then, and then return what you promised you would. And that's it, like, that's state um, away we go. But it, it's tedious and error prone, it's a bit crap, and everybody will be like, ah, it's too hard. Okay, is there a better way? Yeah, there is, but we're going to have to sort of you know, step up the ladder of abstraction to, to get there. So trust me for a little bit. Um, oh, sorry, before we get there, I'll just show you why it is actually kind of annoying. Um, what if in this random number generator we wanted to do something else? We might need to, um, you know, give it a function. That function is going to take some ints and it's going to produce something weird over here. We've got to now start potentially writing lots and lots of these kind of helper functions that are going to be a bit crap. So again, um, and what if we want three random numbers now and a function that's going to take three parameters? This is just going to get shitty. Um, let's go to that new abstraction that I was alluding to. Slide to go. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, create a new type called rand. And this thing um, just takes an RNG and it, it's a function. So rand is a type that is a function. Um, and it's going to take RNG and return value of type A and RNG again. So we've walked away from integers now. We're just sort of um, abstracting out of those. And this is, this is kind of hard to get. Um, initially, this looks weird. Um, but if you remember that type rand plus A is a function, everything kind of makes sense. So how do we use this? Well, we could define a, an int. Um, so, you know, what, what does this mean? Well, you know, this underscore here is a symbol for a, sort of an anonymous um, function in Scala. Um, and so we're just going to go next in on that. We can also define a sort of a do nothing action, which is just another function that takes in the state, the range, um, and then just, um, yeah, and takes in this A that we've passed into this unit function and, and just returns it. There's no actual modifying of the state goes on. Um, and in this sort of formalism, we can also define map. Um, and, and map looks a bit like that. Did you just say map? Yes, OK, of course, FP land. So we're trying to get to abstractions that we know about. Um, and so we can, we can define map over this thing. And this thing is a little bit complicated. But again, if you just recall that type of brand is actually a, a function, um, then the, the sort of the definition of map kind of makes sense. Um, that is, map map is a, um, as a function that takes a, a rand and also a function from A to B and returns a new rand but over type B. And, um, and so its definition is a function. And what we have is it just calls this, this sort of thing that was um, that's passed in, this sort of rand A thing, gives it the, the actual state thing that we're sort of passing through, and then evaluates it and then calls um, you know calls a function on that. And and that's it. So I think I deleted the slide. Oh no, it's it's gonna be there soon. Oh, I forgot about the arrows. There you go, pass it through as before. Um, and now we've written map, we don't need to think so much about the plumbing before. If I've written map or something someone smarter than me has written map, I don't have to worry too much when I want to map over a random number about how to how to how to do that. I just need to remember knowing how to write a function that's going to map from A to B or whatever that is. So you can see here that we've kind of 
it's kind of neater. We can make this um, this function even that just you know it takes a um, you know it takes an int, um, a random int, and that that sort of anonymous function there is who cares about randomness or whatever? It's just a function that takes something from A to B. Is that it? So we're sort of stepping away. Um, okay, so this is just a thing. So you might want to know. Okay, so we've got our our random value. Uh, a random generator, and it's kind of wrapped up some some interesting thing. We might actually want to get that int. How do we do that? Um, so you've got to pass in a random state in order to kick off these things. But then you just use the um, because it's returning a tuple at the end of the day. We can just use this tuple accessor um, dot underscore one to to get that first element of the tuple. The question is, you're probably asking, okay, was this worth it? Maybe I'm now an FP programmer, but what does that mean? Uh, and the neat thing is we can do composition easily, um, so we can, you know, we can write map two, um, and the random plumbing again can be abstracted away. And again, you know, we only pass the random state in once. Uh, but the thing is that we can now start to to build up that library of functional programming tools that, that we are kind of used to. And so, so from map two, then you're going to get to, you know, sequence and flat map and all these nice things. That you know, are, are places that you're, you're you're you know you're kind of getting used to, um, to, to living. In. And if we go back to this picture, I hope that now this this notion of passing that state through, if you think about those function definitions where it was rand and then do some stuff with that and then return that that tuple, that's precisely this picture. Um, you know, and so that, that that again is is just you know dealing with state in a, in a sort of a simple picture. Um, but okay, maybe it's not the case that you only want to make random numbers. What if you want to do arbitrary state? And um, and it turns out that you know, probably unsurprisingly, this random number generator is just an instance of a kind of a more general term. We're going to call it state. And um, you know, so we can make a new type state, which sort of abstracts away from the the C. We don't really need the state to be a seed, it could be a list, it could be a tree, it could be who knows what, so it's just called S. Um, and we, instead of getting next int, which is kind of re restricted to random number generators of integers, we're going to make a new kind of thing, run. But otherwise it's the same, otherwise run is still a function that takes in a, um, a random state, well not random, it takes in some state and then produces um, you know, some output A and a little S thing at the end. Um, and yeah, and so you can see you can just make rand a actually an instance of state. And so if someone goes along and they, um, you know, implement map sequence, flat map, and all these wonderful things over state, and then you can find your problem as an instance of that higher class, and you get all the stuff for free. Um, so I wanted to talk quickly about um, this is just an abstract level about um, a problem that's neither of those. That's just another state full kind of problem. Um, that you might want to consider. And there's an example in the book actually of a, of a state machine, which, which is not this one, but you know, you want to write a program to simulate a robot moving on a 2D plane with a camera. Um, and so uh, we're gonna input, we're gonna use the, the sort of functional programming tool sequence. Um, and we're gonna say our kind of robot action looks like this. So our, our robot action is is going to be kind of a function that takes the world state as it is, and then it will do some action on that robot, and then it will return a view, so whatever the robot sees at that point, and then um, obviously it will return a new world because the world has changed because the robot's moved. Um, you know, and so I'm not going to go into the details of sort of conceptually what it might look like. You might define a few actions for the robot, like move left and move right. You might define a list of orders for the robot to do, such as you know, move left, move right. Maybe you've got other ones, move up, move down, or whatever, um, or stand still. And um, and then you want to set up the simulation. So what? So we've got a list of orders, and what the the function sequence does is it takes this list of of, of states of actions, and then um, sort of concatenates that into a single state that you can run that has. Um, that sort of contains that, that list of actions in it. Um, and so then you can, you can run that state and get the result. Um, and so in order to do that, you just have some initial world. Who knows how you're going to make that up? Who knows how a world is defined? I'm not caring. Um, 
and you just run with that initial world and the, uh, the sequence of actions will be performed. And so that's like another example of state that's not, um, not anything I think, I don't think is kind of interesting. Um, and so you can do all these cool simulations and, and that'd be neat. Okay, so there's a few other little niceties. I'm kind of getting towards the end. Oh gosh, okay. I've been talking for ages now. Um, so, <laughs> a few things towards the end of, uh, of what, what's the neat things we can do. So there's a cool thing called flat map, which um, let's say that you had a function that could take some variable a and convert it into, we'll go back to ram because it's easier. So I read a number that can, that of type b, so maybe a float or something, but it takes a type a. Um, you know, flat map is, is the go-to for that. Um, and so if you have flat map, you might want to perform this extremely complicated um, computation here. Uh, okay, so what is this saying? It's a random list of integers, and it's calculated by, well, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, turns out that if you have flat map and, um, let's just note that that constructs this at length x, you can actually use some sort of nice Scala syntax to unravel this and get you into a place that's much more readable while still, be equi by still being equivalent. And so we can read this section here, this bottom um, you know, chunk of code, and it makes a lot more sense. And so it's saying if this, this variable ns um, is, is, a is a random list of integers, where what we do is we, we choose an x, a random integer x, we're going to choose a random integer y, and then we're going to choose a random, we're going to construct a random list of integers of length x. And then we're going to yield um, a new list, uh, we're going to yield a list where that xs has been um, modded, mod, done, you know, modulo y. And so, although one might argue why you're doing that, um, what, what is certainly clear is that I can kind of understand what this piece of code is doing. And it's neat in that it's kind of procedural. And you can see it does this thing, then this thing, then this thing, and it yields this thing. Um, and so that's a nice, we kind of like to think in that way. It's a nice way to have the best of both worlds. Um, oh, that's the end. So, yeah, in conclusion, state is awesome. Um, it's, uh, you know, composable neat. Do the homework. Remember this picture. I think it explains things pretty well. And look for state in all your problems because you can solve that easily with FP. Thanks. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>